William and Isabella Hewitt, died the 28th of December 1904. An address like five and a half the crescent sounds like something out of a Harry Potter story. Sadly, this story is true and far less wholesome. In fact, it has more in common with the infamous Hewitt family murder, known as the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This is a quainter, though equally heinous crime. Fred Stone was a young apprentice to the gunsmith, whose workshop was in a yard, that was accessed between number 5 and 6 the Crescent in York, England. Next to this was a small cottage that was rented to William and Isabella Hewitt. They were a couple in their early 70s. William had recently retired from his occupation of railway mechanic. Isabella would clean up in the gunsmith's shop, probably for a small credit against the rent of the cottage. That Friday morning of the 30th of December, 1904, Fred Stone noticed that the key for the shop had not been moved. This key would have been used by Isabella Hewitt to enable her to carry out her daily tidying up duties, and she had, strangely, not been seen for several days. Stone was concerned for Isabella's well-being, so he crossed the yard and knocked on the Hewitt's door. Despite the curtains being closed, he was able to get a glimpse of the interior. What he saw shocked him to the core. William's body was face down on the floor, and Isabella was lying on the couch with a bloody cloth over her face. There was blood and brain matter splattered all about the place. When a police sergeant attended the scene, he found the cottage door to be locked from the inside, but managed to gain entry through a partially opened window. What he discovered was in every way as horrific as Stone had described. The old couple had been despicably killed, Isabella was laying with the right side of her face savagely smashed in with what was identified as being a large wooden mallet, and her throat slashed for good measure. The probable kitchen knife that the killer used was found wrapped in a rag inside the cottage. She displayed no defensive wounds, so it was inferred she had probably been asleep, possibly passed out from alcohol consumption, when the attack took place. William had suffered a violent beating to the head, probably using the same wooden mallet, which was found hidden in a wash basket. Poor William had cinder ash and mud smeared on his face. His hands had been smashed, probably due to defending himself or from being stamped on. It was determined that William was initially attacked in the yard, and then his body dragged into the cottage. Both the mallet and knife that were found were blood-stained, but it wasn't possible to prove that the blood derived from William and Isabella. A blood-stained axe that was also found at the murder scene, was ruled out as a murder weapon, presumably because it didn't match the wounds inflicted. So, who would want to murder the kindly pensioners? The police enquiries quickly drew their attention to a man known as Harry Hewitt, who had lived with the couple for decades. However, his true relation to them was unknown. He probably assumed the name of Harry Hewitt sometime after 1891, although it's possible that he had been known by that name, ever since the Hewitts took him in as a baby. Harry Hewitt was born on the 20th of May, 1869 as Jabez Cecil Brooke. The census records show that he lived with the Hewitts from at least 1871, until at least 1891. Not much is definitively known about him, but his parents were believed to be Edward Brooke and Mary Emily Allen, who was born in 1847. They probably were not married, as it was generally thought that Jabez was illegitimate. It appears that the Hewitts became his custodians in return for monetary reward, or at least, received money for his upkeep. They had no children of their own. It is not known who Jabez's benefactor was, other than some relative, which may or may not have been his father. Neither of his parents can be definitively traced. It does not seem that the Hewitts actually regarded him as an adopted son, always referring to him, officially, as a visitor. Jabez eventually gained employment as a trainee pharmacist. He probably left the Hewitts guardianship sometime between 1891 and 1901 to live in Castleford. This may have been what prompted the couple to move to a small cottage, and possibly, also because William retired. Given that Jabez was 22 years old in 1891, it is highly likely, that whatever money the Hewitts had received for him, had been curtailed around that time, especially if he was known to have left the household. It had certainly stopped sometime before 1904. Unfortunately for the Hewitts, Jabez had lost his employment and returned to their home, and retaken up his residence. Except, now there was no money to support him, while the Hewitts were not exactly wealthy. 
they had a modest income from two pensions, amounting to 16 shillings a week. Consequently, at the time of the murder, they were in rent arrears to the tune of more than £14, about 18 months overdue, which is well over a £1,000 in today's money, that's a lot when on a fixed income, and represented nearly 20 weeks of that income. Even worse, Jabez was convinced that the Hewitts were still receiving income for him. So, when they attempted to suggest that he should leave, he did not take kindly. In fact, Isabella was so afraid of him that she had taken to sleeping in a shed at night. In April of 1904, Jabez had made threats against the Hewitts following an argument about money. A friend of the Hewitts had warned them that they would get themselves killed. The police considered Jabez to be their primary person of interest, they issued a description to their officers and ordered them to keep a lookout for him. They did not have to wait long, the next evening, following the discovery of the crime, Jabez paid a visit to the cottage, which was being guarded by a constable. He was wearing a brown hat and long overcoat. He headed straight at the constable. After a short exchange, Jabez found himself shackled with police handcuffs. At no point did he question why he was being arrested. Jabez did not intend to confess. In fact, somewhat oddly, he refused to admit or deny any knowledge of the crime, invoking an effective no-comment stance. He was charged with suspicion of willful murder. A hearing was held on 5 January, 1905. Jabez was apparently, a rather mysterious character. He was described as having a Wild West look and was difficult to read. He chose to remain silent during the few minutes the hearing took. The police did not have any hard evidence against Jabez, it was all circumstantial. The murder trial proceeded, nonetheless. He pleaded not guilty, but deferred his defense. The case for the prosecution was weak, at best, there was only one witness, a William Metcalf, who worked at the station hotel. He passed the entrance to the yard of five and a half the crescent at about 12.15 a.m., on Thursday the 29th of December, and reported to have heard a cry of don't, don't, followed by shuffling noises and a door closing. This had taken place over the five-minute period Metcalf had decided to hang about in the vicinity, after hearing the cry. He claimed to have seen a man leaving the yard and cross to the other side of the road. Metcalf took no further action until after the crime was uncovered on the Friday morning. His description of the man amounted to, he wore a billycock hat, which didn't give the police much to go on. Other witnesses claimed to have seen Jabez on the day prior to the murders. A John Hobson had bought him a pint of beer in the Sun Inn, at Long Marston, to which Jabez had given Hobson a fancy walking stick in way of thanks. This walking stick had been given to William Hewitt at Christmas of 1903 by his employers, the Eastern Railway Company, as a retirement gift. Others had placed Jabez closer to the murder site during Wednesday and Thursday, most notably a Francis Lawson, who swore that he had known Jabez for 12 years, though Jabez disputed knowing him, alleged that he had crossed paths with him at 6 a.m. on the Thursday in Gale Lane. Jabez apparently asked him for directions to the Hunt Kennels, Lawson's description of Jabez having a scruffy beard, wearing an overcoat and a felt hat, tallied with how Jabez was known to look. However, Metcalf did not recognize him. Moreover, Gale Lane is on the opposite side of York to the murder scene. There was only one tangible scrap of evidence, a cuff from the shirt Jabez was wearing when he was arrested was found in the cottage, behind the sofa where Isabella's body was found. But, there was no way to prove when that had been dropped in that location, given that Jabez was a known frequenter of the cottage. He had some spots of blood on his clothes, which could not be identified as human, let alone belonging to the Hewitts. The examining doctor at the trial asserted that William Hewitt had received eleven blows to the head, before being dragged into the cottage, where Isabella was bludgeoned five times, and then her throat was cut. The killer must have escaped through the open window. It was his opinion that this would have taken about half an hour, which therefore excluded the man seen by Lawson. William still had his watch and chain upon him, when his body was found, which seemed to rule out robbery as a motive. These flimsy prosecution arguments were easily countered by the defense, who ultimately did a good job. So, it was no great surprise that the jury found Harry Hewitt, aka Jabez Brook, not guilty. The police did not reopen the case, as they were of the opinion that the perpetrator had already been apprehended. 
There certainly isn't a lot to work with here. The crime did have a personal element to it, and the only motive that could be presented was Brooke's perceived wrongdoing by the Hewitts. Some details are odd, why hide the murder weapons inside the cottage where they would easily be found? Unless, they were not the murder weapons. It wasn't possible to identify the blood on those articles, so may not have even been human. We would also have to presume that the injuries perfectly fitted those makeshift weapons, and given the apparent singular lack of any kind of forensic expertise employed in this case, this wasn't necessarily a reliable deduction. Escape through the window, could have been to buy some time, but I'm not sure that was even necessary. As for the crime not being possible within five minutes, well, I think it is possible, albeit a stretch. The killer could have been the man seen by Lawson, Perhaps an altercation took place, the killer left and stewed, before returning and committing the murder. Perhaps Brooke got into an argument with William Hewitt over giving away his special walking stick, then stormed off, only to later return and exact a twisted revenge. It is entirely possible. Why did Brooke return to the cottage, if he was the killer? Perhaps to retrieve the cuff he had lost in the frenzy of the crime. This was, after all, the only evidence that could place him at the scene. It is entirely possible that Brooke had a key to the cottage and could have locked the door from the outside. However, the records do not indicate whether there was a key in the lock on the inside, and if there were, could the door still be locked from the outside? Modern locks generally do not allow for that, but this was 1904. Then again, if it was bolted inside, that would require an escape through a window. Also, had such a key been found on Jabez when he was arrested, this would have figured in the prosecution case, unless he already disposed of it before realizing he needed to return to the cottage. Of course, random murders have always been committed, so a stranger cannot be ruled out. But all things considered, I tend to agree with the police's conclusion. If you are wondering what became of Jabez Brook, aka Harry Hewitt, after he was released from custody in 1905, well, that is the only real mystery associated with this case. He probably changed his name and left the York area, possibly emigrated. In any event, he disappears from the records, never to be found again.